Hello, and here I am in the chapel at St. John's. It's a little echoey in here with no one else here, and it's a very odd way to do a sermon. But in these days, this is how it will be for a while. So let me just say, as I start today, that if you haven't already listened to the gospel reading for today, which is also on the website, you can do that. Or you can take a minute, put me on pause, and read John chapter 4, verses 3 to 42, the story of the Samaritan woman who met Jesus at the well. So my prayer as we begin is that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to God, our Father, in the name of Jesus and in the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as the women who came to the brunch a couple of weeks ago would tell you, I love to apply my imagination to the Gospels, to try to put myself inside it and get inside the people who are there. And John actually makes that really easy. He gives so much detail about the interactions that Jesus has with people. We have 38 verses devoted to this story about the Samaritan woman, which is amazing. So let's start by setting the scene. The first verses of John chapter four tell us that Jesus left Judea on his way to Galilee, which is about 175 kilometers straight north, and that he had to go to Samaria on his way. Well, technically, he didn't have to. It was the most direct route. But a lot of Jewish leaders of that day would have gone the long way around just to avoid going through Samaria. The bad blood between Jews and Samaritans is well known and documented, even though they started out as common descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even though, even at this point, they share a devotion to the writings of Moses. We'll see more about that, but at this point, when this story happens, their paths have diverged for more than a thousand years, and now they really have as little to do with each other as possible. Even so, Jesus is on his way north through Samaria. He's sitting by a well at noon, and a Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Now, we always assume, no doubt rightly, that this woman is an outcast because she comes at noon. And the reason she's an outcast is always connected to what we learn about her five husbands and the fact that she's now living with someone who is not her husband. But some of the books that I have read about this say things like, she was so hungry for love, she welcomed anyone who would have her. Or, she was living a hopeless, immoral life, and her choices had cost her. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I have a bit of a bone to pick with this, as a matter of fact. To me, that is a classic example of us putting modern day thinking back on the first century, where things were quite different. There are only two ways that this woman could have lost five husbands, through death, or through divorce. Maybe some or all of her husbands died and people avoided her because they thought she had bad luck. Stay away from her, she's got the evil eye. Maybe one died and she was passed off to a brother or a cousin who wasn't that keen. Women didn't have the power to divorce and the power of men to divorce had become quite broad Maybe she couldn't have children. Maybe she was too outspoken. The rest of this passage suggests that could have been the case. We do not know for sure, but whatever has brought her to this well at noon, alone, we know that she has become a marginalized person living on the edges of her community. So what is she thinking as she walks up to this well and sees Jesus sitting there. Oh, brother, who's this guy? He looks like a Jew. What's he doing out here in the middle of the day? And Jesus, 
who is alone because his disciples have gone to get food, says to her, give me a drink. Here's another important note. It was completely socially inappropriate for a man in that culture to speak to a woman alone at any length if she wasn't a relative. So Jesus' behavior here is actually quite scandalous. How is it that you, a Jew, she says, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? She has every reason to be suspicious. She has to be wondering, what's going on here? Maybe even, am I safe? Jesus replies, if you knew the gift of God and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Jesus so rarely speaks in simple, straightforward answers. Have you noticed that? It's always in layers. He always makes people work for it. Nicodemus, from the previous chapter, the disciples, this woman, just the same. Living water. Why is this Jew talking to me about a gift from God? And then we see seven verses of this back and forth between them. Jesus steadily drawing her in, her dodging and weaving, putting up barriers, trying to keep her feet, I think, in this completely unexpected conversation. Where do you get that living water? Think you're better than our father Jacob, do you? Give me some of that water. Then I wouldn't have to come here every day. Then Jesus delivers the zinger. Go call your husband and come back. Well, you must be a prophet, she says. So what about this whole issue about Jerusalem versus Mount Gerizim? Talk about changing the subject. She is doing everything she can to hold him off. And then Jesus starts pouring, all, pouring out words of salvation. He explains to this Samaritan outcast woman standing by a well in the desert in the noonday sun, the nature of God as spirit. And he tells her that the Father is looking for those who will worship him in their very being and in the faithfulness of their lives. I know the Messiah is coming, she says, the one who's called the Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Is she softening? The Samaritans, as I said, followed the books of Moses and had a belief in the Messiah based on Deuteronomy 18, where Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me and you will listen to him. I know he's coming, she says. We're all hoping for that day. And finally, a straight answer from Jesus. I am he. You're right to put your hope in the one that's coming. And that's me. Jesus engages in conversation with this outcast woman, choosing connection with her, choosing her spiritual well-being over social, cultural, religious barriers, and even in spite of her own efforts to keep him at a distance. He leads her step by step toward a revelation of God and of himself. We know as a result of this conversation, the people of the city stream out to see Jesus. In the end, many say, we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. For the past couple of months, our sermons have focused in one way or another on the mission of God. And it's fairly obvious how this passage is about that. 
But I'd like to sum it up as a reminder that the mission of God is always to us and through us. Like the woman at the well, we are known. We are accepted as we are, yet called to something more. Jesus invests in us. He overcomes even the barriers that we put up ourselves. He brings the mission of God to each of us individually. And like the woman at the well, we have the capacity to influence the people in our lives as Jesus brings the mission of God through us to others, offering a chance for them to see for themselves. We need to grab both of these truths with both of our hands. It is not either or, it's both and. We need to receive God's mission to us. Richard often reminds us how much we are loved. We have a hard time taking that in. But if we do not receive what Jesus has for us and abide in that love, then what we have to share will be thin. And at the same time, if we get too comfortable receiving and forget that there is a mission through us, we miss out on the growth that we can only experience by participating in God's work, to say nothing of what others miss out on. We need to continually grow in our ability to freely receive and participate. Then everywhere we go and everything we do will be infused with Jesus' spirit, whether we're trying to be missional or not. So just a word now about what missional looks like in a COVID-19 environment. I struggled with whether to even preach this sermon at first before we knew that services would be canceled. How can we talk about a Samaritan woman from 2000 years ago and ignore all these concerns that we have right now? Well, we can't and we don't need to. This also is not an either or proposition. We are never in a mission to us or mission through us situation. It's always both and. How do we receive Jesus' mission to us in this environment? We need to find time to be quiet with him in prayer, to rest in him, to remember his faithfulness and let his spirit calm and ground our spirits. We are never alone. And how do we let him continue his mission through us? Well, that is going to be different for everyone. I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to take Richard's suggestion to identify five people that you can pray for and show love to. If you're able, Maybe you can offer to help an elderly neighbor with grocery shopping, something like that. That would be great if you can. But in these days, even if people aren't suffering from a virus, and most aren't yet, they may well be suffering from fear and from a growing sense of isolation. You might feel that. You might be watching this by yourself. An email, a text, a phone call, just to say hello and check on how someone's doing. Aside from the benefit of being completely germ-free, could help that person to know that they're not forgotten in the midst of all this, that they are not alone. That could be a powerful way to participate in Jesus' mission to the world in these challenging times. So let the Spirit of Jesus gently guide you. And as we know, His Spirit is always able to accomplish abundantly far more than what we can ever ask or imagine, both to us and through us. May we put our trust in Him. Amen. Stay well.